first woman governor um, in New York. And for our law day, the last law day that we have, that's something else that we do. We go into the schools in the Bronx and any of the schools who actually want us to go there. We bring our volunteers with us and we tell them, all the kids, we sit down and have a conversation with them about what the law is and how they can affect it if they go into the law, into that legislature, judiciary, and legal field. And our last Law Day keynote speaker was then Senator Brian Benjamin, who is now the Lieutenant Governor of New York. So uh, we've also had Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer speak at one of our events, and we always get notable uh, assembly people. Uh, we've had Assemblywoman Latoya Joyner, Assemblywoman uh, Latrice Walker, and uh, Tremaine Wright, New York City Councilwoman Alika Amprey Samuels. So we always have great women show up and talk to us like the three panelists that you are going to hear about today. So our lesson today is say yes and show up, speak up and woman up. And the reason we have this lesson is that girls are often taught to be cautious and not take any challenges that they're not sure they can master. In fact, the Harvard um, School did a study that and where they gave women and girls a job description and told them to apply. And the fact was that women did not want to apply for a job unless they were 100% sure they could meet all of the job description. But other studies have shown that when women actually went ahead and applied for the job, whether they felt that they met 100% of the qualifications or not, they were 16% more likely to get the job. So there is something, psychologists are actually sure that saying yes to a challenge, whether you think you can meet it or not at that time, actually works. You actually step up and, and you can meet that challenge. And our three panelists today are going to talk to us about that, about the challenges that they have met and how they it's made them better people within their profession. So our three panelists. Deborah Martin Owens is the East Coast Diversity Director at Sidley Austin LLP, where she develops and implements programs, policies, and initiatives that support Sidley's strategies on diversity and inclusion goals. Previously, she served as the Executive Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the New York City Bar. Prior to that, she was a staff attorney at Quinn Emanuel for nearly 12 years. And earlier than that, she was a junior court attorney for the New York State Unified Court System. While in law school, Deborah also interned for the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, who is now on the US Supreme Court, where she served as a jurist, as a judge at the United States Court of Appeals. Among her many awards, um, she most recently was among Cranes, she was named as Cranes New York Business 2021 Notable Women in New York in the law. So Deborah is a, a graduate of uh, the law school at Hofstra and the State University of New York at Albany. Our next uh, panelist is Samira Shah, who is the general counsel of WWE, the World Wrestling Entertainment Corp. And Samira is a uh, general counsel and corporate secretary over there and she oversees all of WWE's legal affairs and serves as the principal legal advisor for the company. Her oversight includes litigation, intellectual property, which she'll tell you a little bit about, corporate governance, government relations, risk management, and so much more. Samira has over 20 years of legal experience representing companies in various different roles. And she earned her JD from Columbia University uh, School of Law, where she was a Harlan Fisk Stone uh, Scholar. She was also the executive editor of the Columbia Human Rights Law Review and a submissions editor for the Columbia Journal of Gender and Law. While in law school, Samira also interned at Al Haq, uh, the West Bank affiliate of the International Commission of Jurists. Before law school, she was a Fulbright Fellowship. Uh, she was awarded that fellowship to study in Syria. And she also interned for the United Nations High Commission of Refugees. She earned her Bachelor's of Arts degree in uh, Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations and a Master's of Arts in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Chicago. Our third speaker, uh, last but not least, is Amy Wallace, and she is a professor at New York Law School. Um, she is also the Program Director for Street Law, which she will tell you about. Um, Professor Wallace is uh, at the law school where she directs the street law program and teaches advanced legal methods. 
Um, Amy graduated from the University of Toronto in 1997 with a degree in political science. She attended the U uh, Georgetown University Law Center where she participated in the street law clinic. Um, the, the good thing, uh, an interesting thing about Amy is that uh, after she went to law school, she decided she wanted to teach high school full time. And she did that at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, uh, which again, she will tell you about uh, before becoming a professor in uh, the law school. She obtained her master's in education from Lehman College. Um, and she worked with a number of law related education nonprofits in New York City, Westchester area before reconnecting with street law. So welcome ladies. Thank you so much, Mona, for having us. We're so excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Tebra. So um, you ladies have heard me uh, talk about the statistics about um, young ladies and girls and, and how it's really hard to, to for, for people to overcome that fear of meeting challenges. So we are going to talk a lot about that today. But before we jump into that, um, one of the things that we talk about with our young ladies, especially in high school, when we know that they're going to go out into uh, the working world, we teach them about networking. And in that networking session, we talk a lot about an elevator pitch, right? So we give them the example of if you get into an elevator and Oprah Winfrey is there or Michelle Obama is there and you want to tell, you want them to know something about you very quickly. You want them to walk out of that elevator and say, yeah, I know who that is and I like that person. Let me reach out to them. Um, so we're gonna be doing elevator pitches for, <laughs> for you ladies as well. So the young ladies on the call can see how it's done. And we're gonna start with Deborah. So Deborah, sorry, you're first. Well, if I saw Michelle Obama in the elevator, I'd probably just jump on her <laughs> and hug her. But, um, but thank you so much, Myrna. I would say I'm Deborah Martin Owens, and I help women and people of color become successful at large law firms. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> you said <laughs> one minute. <laughs> Very so, Samira, what is your elevator pitch? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on this panel. And that's a really hard elevator pitch to follow, Deborah. Um, mine's a little bit longer. Uh, so I would start off by saying I am a problem solver. So I grew up um, in a small town in Kansas. I immigrated there with my parents when I was three, without speaking a word, word of English. Uh, so it was just my parents and my three siblings and myself. We were the town diversity pretty much um and uh so i grew up kind of as an outsider but learning how to kind of fit in and be part of a, a community and then how to kind of thrive in that community so i um take that kind of lesson wherever i go um and try to look at things both from kind of fresh eyes as as an outsider and but also kind of understand what the people I'm working with are going through so I can bring solutions that maybe they didn't see themselves, but ones that can work for them. And that's that's what we mean when we say diversity, right? Because when you look at a problem in a whole bunch of different ways, you can solve it that much faster and better. So thank you, Samira. Um, Amy, elevator pitch. Thank you. Um, well, I have to start by agreeing with Deborah. If either of those amazing women were in my elevator, I don't know that I would be able to muster many words, but um, I would try to say um, my name is Amy Wallace and I'm a professor and I believe that public legal education is critical in a modern democracy. Um, I get to teach law students how to become better thinkers um, and better writers. Um, and I love teaching law students, but at the same time, I don't think that understanding the law and how it impacts our community should be reserved just for that small percentage of people who get to go to law school. Um, I think it's a crucial life skill. Um, so I also work with law students and law professors and lawyers and um, help them figure out how to go into the community and teach practical life skills to community members. And that's the clinic that you were speaking about. Um, so my law students go into a high school in the Bronx and they work with the high school students to develop their critical thinking skills and their advocacy skills. And, you know, it will be my dream if one of those high school students comes to the law school one day, because I think um, we need to work on the diversity in the, in the legal field. But I think it's equally important that those high school students become better advocates so they can go into their community and participate actively and, um, and advocate, advocate for the things that are important to them. 
That is so true. I agree. Thank you, um, Amy. All right, so back to you, Deborah. Um, the, the second part of the icebreaker before we get into the substantive parts of the panel discussion is that we want everybody on the call to learn something about you that is not in your bio. And you know, fl full disclosure to everybody on the call, I read to you maybe a snippet of each of these women's background because of course we'd be here for the whole hour if I was to read everybody's backgrounds and all of their accomplishments. So what is it about you that's not on your bio that I didn't read um, and that's fun and maybe only your friends or family know about you? Oh, that's a good one. Um, what's fun, oh, actually what, <laughs> So I, as a kid growing up, um, I grew up in the 80s and I loved um, anything Adidas. I'm dating myself. It's like Run DMC. And I just wanted those Adidas tracksuits. But we grew up so poor that I could not afford it. So I am now in my golden age and twilight have amassed a huge Adidas collection of track suits, <laughs> sneakers, <laughs> you name it. And so on the weekends, when I want to just relax and, you know, maybe meet friends for brunch, you would catch me in a pair of sneakers, which is unheard of. If anyone knows me professionally, I pretty much dress very buttoned up. But on the weekends, I really enjoy my track suits and my sneakers, much to my husband's <laughs> uh, curiosity as to why another package is coming with Mark oh, Adidas. <laughs> that is hysterical. <laughs> Samira? Once again, I feel like uh, this is a hard act to follow. Um, so I guess one thing that people don't often know about me is that in um, my uh, free time, when I get the chance, I love to rock climb. Um, and uh, I like to rock climb both inside and outside on, you know, cliffs. And um, I ha have had kind of the, the great pleasure of being able to introduce my kids to it over the years. And now I, um, I climb with them. And the ultimate reward for me after a good day of rock climbing is to have a lot of chocolate. <laughs> Very good. Amy? Um, so I am a, a huge, uh, crazy animal lover. Um, I am well known to my local animal rescue for bringing in injured animals that I find um, here in the suburbs. Um, I've brought them a variety of animals, including uh, rabbit, uh, turtles, and even a hawk, which was very tricky to catch. Um, and I guess just so I'd have an extra story today, I spent you know 30 minutes trying to catch a lost dog today, which we did eventually catch and return to the owner. Um, but I sort of chuckled to myself um, when I was thinking about it. I was like, well, just to prove that I am the crazy animal lover. Well, thank you. All right, so that, that was the icebreaker portion of it. So we are now going to dig into the substantive topic, which is just meeting challenges head on. Um, you may not know this, but you know, for every one of these leadership lessons, I, I talk extensively about my background and the fact that you know, I, I come from a family of immigrants. I came from Honduras when I was almost six years old. I had to learn English as a third language. Uh, Samira, so I understand completely just being lost um, in this world while you're trying to navigate it. Um, but one of the things that I, I, the reason, right, one of the reasons for this particular lesson, which is say yes, then show up, speak up, and woman up, is just watching my mother at the beginning of our journey here in the United States, and she was a cleaning lady. So one of my mother had like two or three jobs all the time. We were latchkey kids. My, my siblings and I sort of grew up by ourselves. But one of the jobs that she had was uh, as a cleaning lady at a local uh, movie theater um, in the evenings. And she would, you know, have to clean the bathrooms and, and the, the theaters after people got out, sweep up the popcorn and what have you. But she was really good at it. Like you can be good at anything that you do, regardless of, of what your profession is, right? Or what you're doing as a job. And while she was there, my mother would get offered promotions all the time, right? Because they assumed that she didn't want to clean bathrooms for the rest of her time there. So they would tell her, you know, you can go to the box office. You will promote you to the box office or we'll promote you to the concession stand. And my mother always said no. Um, and the reason she said was, oh, her English wasn't good or her math wasn't up to snuff. 
But I realized that she was just scared, right? She was scared of meeting that challenge and maybe failing at it. So for me, that became the first part of, of the mantra that I live by, which is to say yes. Somebody offers you an opportunity, think about it, and but then say yes and meet that challenge. So um, let's start there with this topic. What scared you at the beginning of your career and how did you meet that challenge, right? How, why and how did you say yes to that challenge at the beginning of your career? So uh, let's just go in the same order we've been going, which is Deborah first, then Samira, and then Amy. You know, um, I'm the first in my family to be uh, to graduate from high school, so I didn't really have a lot of of any kind of like just like your mom. My mom was a nurse's aide. Um, she always worked temp jobs. Um, we were latchkey kids, and I just had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so I never really had anyone to kind of like help me navigate this space, but I knew deep in my heart that I wanted to do more than just what I was seeing in my community. And so when I started to think about like even finishing high school, like that was a big excitement, then going to college. And I share this story often, but when I graduated from high school, I went to a, uh, a two-year college. And in my first year of the two-year college, a professor came up to me and said, I wanna see you. I'm going to talk about your paper. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? And she'd asked me, she said, why are you here? And I said, why am I here? Because um, you asked me to come here. And she's like, no, why you're at this university, at this college, you should be at a four year. And I didn't really understand it. I didn't realize that I didn't know about going to a four year. I only knew about going to a two year. Mm -hmm. And she said, here, I'm gonna, I'm dating myself. I'm gonna give you $40 and you're gonna apply to the SUNYs. And I applied to the SUNYs and that's how I got to SUNY Albany um, and finished my four years there. And then as I continued on, I worked a little bit. I have a, a career even before law school working as a paralegal for a number of years. And then I get into law school and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. I feel like I didn't feel like prepared, but I knew that I just didn't, you know, there was something in me that just didn't want to live like I lived as a child. And that can sometimes be a great motivating factor. It doesn't always have to be this grand, like I want to be, you know, this thought leader in the world. That's great, you know, and, and, and that's wonderful, but it could just be about I just want to be able to buy enough track suits. Maybe that's, <laughs> I, 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 just, I just want to be able to, you know, um, I, re I remember a professor said to me in college and it, it resonated so much to me as I was older. She said, you want to have enough money in the world to buy as many books as you want. And as a book lover, it was so interesting because I always had a library card, which is wonderful. But then as I got older and Amazon came along, I was like, oh my God, I can buy books. And that was the thing that resonated all the time to me is that I was moving from, you know, below poverty to now, you know, this particular class that I'm in. And it, it, it just resonated with me that I, I was more scared not to try than I was to kind of stay where I was. So I don't know if that answers oh, your question. question. Yeah. <laughs> I was more scared to not try, to not you know, push forward, even though I didn't see it in my family. Mm -hmm. And I still stand at, in my immediate family as the only one that has a college education. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, you know, um, it, it, it really, to me, is like, wow, okay, that was in me. And also, too, I will say, along the way, I found people really like that professor, you know, 30 something years ago, other people that came along, my law professor, my mentor, who recently passed away, all those people were sort of guiding me and I'll just, I'll stop there, but it, it, it's, a, it's that something in you to say, I wanna move forward, even if it scares me. I hope that makes sense. It does, mm -hmm. it makes sense. Um, Samira? So uh, when I uh, went to law school, I originally thought that I was gonna be a human rights lawyer. And I did um, an internship my, um, after my second, now, after my first year of law school in the occupied territories um, in uh, the, the West Bank. Um, and uh, this is a territory that's occupied by uh, Israel and it's been at war basically for 50 years. 
And um, I uh, thought that that's really what I wanted to do. And, you know, being a bit, um, I guess, overconfident, I thought peace in the Middle East is surely something that I can achieve. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was there for, for a summer and I learned that, you know, being a human rights lawyer is really hard. And that uh, you may advocate for your client very strongly and you can, you know, write uh, about all the problems, but it's kind of unlikely that you're going to achieve peace in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so I, I decided, you know, that that's a great goal, um, but I think that as a legal career, I probably want something that's more achievable in the short term. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I would learn how to be a trial lawyer. Um, and so then when I started at a law firm after um, law school, the first case that I was given was literally about rocket science. Really? <laughs> and I thought to myself, I don't know if I can do this. Like mm. I barely remember anything about science. I took as little science as I possibly could in college. Um, but I thought, you know, what have I got to lose? Let mm. me try. And what I found was, you know, if you, if, if, if you learn how to learn, then you can really learn about anything. Mm -hmm. And um, that the more you learn about something, the more interesting it gets. Um, and so then I, I found that I actually really loved the job because I got to learn about different industries and different issues um, all the time. So I was constantly learning. And it, it was something that um, I felt that I could really um, understand and uh, be able to to be a good advocate, but I really felt at the beginning, like there's no way I can do this. Mm -hmm. And the way that I kind of um, got around that was I looked around me at the people who I thought were successful in this field. Mm -hmm. And um, I, by nature, I'm actually not very, uh, I'm not uh, an outgoing person. I'm um, pretty shy. And so for me to be a trial lawyer, I decided I was going to play the character of a trial lawyer. Yeah. Okay. And um, so then when I would, you know, when I would actually go into court and have to examine witnesses or at deposition and where I'm exa examining witnesses, I would get into character, I would play that character, and then I would get out. Oh. And that's how, that's how it worked for me. And, and that's something that we actually tell the kids when we teach them mock trial, because some of the kids get really nervous and like, well, I'm going to throw up. And we're like, well, you know, you've seen some of the law and order shows or you've seen you just have to be that character and, and they get that. So that makes sense that you, you said that. Amy. Thank you. So the anecdote that you mentioned at the beginning about um, how women look at a job description and if they don't meet 100% of the qualifications, they won't even bother to apply. That really resonated with me. And I was thinking about um, an example of that from my own life where about six years ago, I was working for a nonprofit, which is Street Law Inc. in Washington, DC. And sort of middle of May, we got a request from a school in the Bronx that wanted um, us to design a summer program for them. They wanted 45 hours of legal instruction and 10 law students to be hired to teach this. And we had about a month to do it. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to do the project. It was very similar to the clinical program I'd done in law school, um, but I was terrified. I was terrified of failing. I was terrified of doing a so-so job. Um, mm -hmm. I thought, I don't think it's possible to write that much um, curriculum in such a short period of time. Um, and it was, it was also a personally really hard time for me. My mom was very ill. And so I, I really, I almost said no. I was very tempted to say no. Um, but I said to myself, you know, very few things are a success on day one. You know, it's okay if things are, you know, a work in progress. Um, but I think that's a really hard thing for a lot of women is we, we need it to be perfect right away. Exactly. Um, so, so we did it. I said, yes, I, I did the program. Um, we just finished our sixth successful summer. And it was through that program that I met the professor that connected me with New York Law School. So if I hadn't said yes, I wouldn't be where I am. <laughs> yep. That is true. And that happens a lot, I, I think, right? That you have that serendipity of just saying yes, doing your best, you know, showing up, speaking up, and then womaning up. And then something else comes out of it that maybe you didn't even see or you didn't think it was going to happen. So 
Um, of course, saying yes is not enough. So you have to take all the other steps, right? So, you know, not just saying the yes, but um, showing up and speaking up and womaning up. And, um, and of course, and once you woman up, then you get more challenges because people know that you can get the job done. So now it's like they, they want to give you more work. So we'll go the, the opposite way with, uh, so let's start with you, um, Amy. What does that look like in your line of work when you, you know, you take all of the steps. So now you've said yes, for instance, to this uh, street law challenge, and you you showed up, you spoke up, and and you you womaned up. So what was the next step? You said you're in your sixth year, but what comes next? Well, I just think you just try to um, you improve every day. You improve every summer. You reflect. Um, you stop and think about. Okay, that was good. How did we do this? But how can we do it just a little bit better? How can we make it a little bit bigger? How can we reach you know a bigger audience? Mm -hmm. um, I think, and I, I think this is true regardless of your field. I feel like so many of us have all these ideas um, for projects or programs or whatever, um, but we can't do these things on our own. And often we need to get colleagues or other organizations on board with us and maybe they're not ready today. Um, and that can be disappointing, but I think, you know, we just have to, sometimes you just need to be patient um, and stay in contact with people. That's one of my big um, pieces of advice for my law students is always stay in contact. And I'm sure you guys talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, something that might not happen today might happen 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was approached to teach the clinic that I'm currently teaching. I was approached 10 years before I started there by someone else at the same law school who said, oh, you should come start this clinic. Um, but she proposed it to the law school and they weren't ready for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't spend the next 10 years, you know, you know, moping because I didn't get that job. I just kept getting experience. And so when the opportunity came up again, I was, I was ready to convince the law school that they needed this program. Wow. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, Samira, what about you? Like, what is the next step after you, you've done everything? Uh, you know, you, you've, you've said yes, you've shown up, you've spoken up, you've womaned up. What's the next step? I think that the next step is really kind of understanding um, understanding who you're serving, right? So as lawyers, right, we're we're always kind of serving a client, and so it's really understanding what somebody's needs are and trying to kind of meet those needs, and that really comes down to I think two things. One is having um, people skills, and you get those over time just by interacting with people, mm -hmm. right? And you have to be able to kind of interact with all different kinds of people and get comfortable with that. Um, and that involves kind of asking lots of questions without pissing people off, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the second part is kind of doing, doing your homework, right? So being prepared. And like I said, when you kind of learn how to learn, then you can kind of learn anything. And when you put those two together, when you kind of learn people and you learn kind of the material, then you can really get through pretty much any challenge. Thank you. Um, Deborah? I, I just agree with um, Amy and Samir. I, I agree 100%. Um, it's really about um, sort of being like the trusted advisor, that person that you can go to. You always want to be the person that people know that they can go to and get an honest answer out of, even if the answer is, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know, but I'll figure it out for you. Or I'll come back and I'll or think of something creative. So for me, it's always I'm dealing with people all the time. Like I think of myself as a therapist, as sometimes, you know, as a mom, I'm not a mom, but sometimes as a mom, um, giving uh, support to our lawyers. Um, it's critical. I mean, they are doing they're under tremendous pressure, you know, from our work that we do, from clients, from just the profession itself. And so being that person they can go to and talk to about whatever is going on with it, whether it be work or personal, you want to be that trusted advisor. You want to be able to give them good advice, solid advice. And I've leaned that not only from just my life experience as someone who's been in the legal profession now since um, 95 at this point, but also too, as, um, as someone who's a lived experience as a black woman of how to navigate a space um, that not always really thought about us as women, as women of color, as, as just people. And so it's really important for me that I continue to support, uh, be that trusted advisor. And even if I'm scared, continue on. Um, then most of the times I don't have an answer. You know, most of the times I say, you know, 
this will be what it will be, but let's see how we can get you to the point of where you would be happy. Mm -hmm. And so that's, um, I would say that's been, you know, some of the things that I've had to face. But yes, saying yes um, also requires you digging deep and and working hard. Mm -hmm. Now, what challenges do you face on a day-to-day in your role at Sidley? Yes, um, I think the challenge, the number one challenge, everybody wants to have a more diverse workforce, right? They want to have more people and LGBTQ and women and people of color at the table. Everybody wants that, but it's how we get there. We sometimes may have challenges. Um, And so I think the number one thing is just sort of getting people to understand that in our efforts to bring those to the table, it may not look like how it looks. So I think about my own story. Like I'm here, I was at a big law before, I'm at another big law, but really, am I supposed to really be here, right? When you think about, I didn't go to elite schools, right? Um, And so it's like, how did that happen? And if you look back and you start to peel the onion, you can see that I've been working for so long to get to these places. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've always been uh, that person. But I think the biggest challenge is getting people to see people more broadly. Think about like where we uh, source our lawyers from. You know, sometimes it's not always the Ivy League. Sometimes we need to think about other schools, Um, particularly I had a story, um, one of my mentees is at Brooklyn Law School and he had went to Columbia undergrad and went to Brooklyn and people were, you know, we were in a meeting, um, this is at my old uh, shop and people were just not understanding it. And I, you know, that's one great thing about having diversity at the table. I said, oh, he probably got a full scholarship. And they were like, is that why you think he went? I was like, yeah, what did you think? And they were like, well, maybe I thought maybe the grades, I was like, oh, no, he probably got a full scholarship, went to speak to him. At that point, he wasn't my mentee. Then I took him under my wing. And he was like, yeah, I made the calculated decision. I got a full ride at Columbia. And I wanted to go a full ride at law school because we cannot afford it. We, mm-hmm. I still live at home and I'm still working um, to help my family on, during the summers. And now he's at a big law firm. And so he's doing well. But it just shows you that, um, you know, we have to think about where we're getting our talent. Like, what, what are we doing? Let's start to talk about the stories, because if it's not, you wouldn't have a Deborah Martin Owens here mm-hmm. if you didn't think about how to, like, expand your, your thinking. So I would say that is one of the things. And just like, you know, law firms are, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. They, they're, the legal profession, I wouldn't even say law firms, legal profession is what it is, but it is has to understand, and just by the three of us here, the four of us here, excuse me, that it's going to change. Mm-hmm. It's going to take a long time. I really do. I may not see it in my lifetime, but it will change as more women and people of color and LGBTQ come into the firm, into law firms, in-house, academia, it's going to change. And I think that's, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the challenges. It's just sort of the mindsets. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. I, I just briefly uh, follow up on that too. It's not just how we see ourselves or um, do I belong here, but also how, how society still perceives us, right? True story. I went to a firm event last month and like Samira, I've gotten to the point in my life where and career, I think, where I can just have a conversation with anybody, right? And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter who the person is, it's just, you know, just having a conversation. And I'm sitting there, I'm having a conversation, eating something, and a young man that I've been talking to for 15 minutes says to me, well, how long have you been a paralegal at the firm? (laughs) So I just kind of stood there and I laughed at myself because, you know, as a Black woman, it happens a lot, but I am literally the only Black person, the only Black woman at the firm, and you're telling me I'm a paralegal. So I, I just kind of smiled at him and I said, I'm not. And then I got up and went to do something else, like, let's figure it out, <laughs> like, figure it out. You'll figure it out at some point. But, you know, it's, it's that perception, right, that you're a Black woman, so you can't possibly be anything more than a paralegal. Not that there's anything wrong with a paralegal, but um, I just found it funny. I, I was just laughing the whole evening. Um, Samira, what challenges do you face uh, day to day in your function? So day to day, I um, get asked about all sorts of different um, issues throughout the business and um, business moves really fast. So 
Um, WWE is in lots of different forms of entertainment. So there's the in-ring entertainment. There's also um, uh, entertainment that's like on the big screen um, and uh, lots of live events. And, um, and we're operating during a pandemic. Right. So there are lots of kind of different legal issues that come up and people want answers like now, right? Um, because we have a show on like tonight. So um, some part of the legal, uh, part of the challenge is uh, being able to one, kind of figure out what the issues are mm -hmm. and then figure out like who the right people are to, to deal with those um, issues and get it done really quickly. But then two, when you have to say, oh, actually we need to slow down because there's something really important, which no business person likes to hear. Um, um, but you know, ultimately we'll, we'll get this done for you, but we can't do it like immediately. Yeah. That's one of those challenges. And it's, you know, it's I think it's it's sometimes even harder to deliver that message, like as a woman of color. Oh yeah. Um, because I think sometimes you don't people don't immediately give you kind of that authority that you would have mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if I were my, you know, if I were a different gender and uh, a different color, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I think the way that it becomes effective is just kind of over time building those relationships with people. Mm -hmm. so they learn to trust you and you become that trusted advisor. And so they know like when you say, okay, actually this time it's a real issue, we need to slow down that they trust that you know what you're doing and you wouldn't say that unless there really was something going on yeah thank you what about you amy what challenges do you see day to day in your work so i mean i think for me the, the fact i mean you said it in the opening that um i sort of have had a crazy path and um because my path is not traditional um because um i didn't go the way that you know people often do, um, then it can be sometimes difficult for people to um, maybe see the value of the work that I do or the contributions that I make. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to law school thinking that um, I was going to be a corporate lawyer and everyone I knew was either going to a big firm to do litigation or going to a big firm to do corporate law. And so that's what I did. Um, I, you know, after my second summer, uh, my second year of law school, I went to a big firm like I thought I was supposed to do. And at the end of that, I had a great time, worked with great people. At the end of that summer, I accepted a full-time job. So went back for my third year of law school. And then I enrolled in this clinic, this street law clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to teach at a high school in Washington, D.C. It was Benjamin, Benjamin Banneker High School in Washington, D.C. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. Yeah. Um, but I'd already accepted a full-time job at this law firm, this amazing, great law firm, which was what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, okay, great. This is an experience I'm going to have this year. And I graduated, went to the law firm and worked hard with amazing people that I really liked. Um, and I started doing a ton of pro bono work because that firm fortunately let me do a ton of pro bono work. So mm -hmm. I would start at 6 a.m. and I would go to the Bronx and coach their mock trial and moot court team. And then I would go from the Bronx to Chelsea where I was teaching at a high school, um, a law course there. And then I would go to the law firm at 10 to be, be the lawyer. Um, and then I just woke up one morning and I was thinking to myself, I only like my day from 6 to 10 a.m. And I really loved the people that I was working with. And it sort of ties back to that same concept we were talking about before. I was like, am I really going to quit this job, this dream job that everybody wants with these nice people? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to disappoint my family. I'm going to disappoint my friends. I, mm -hmm. I'm going to disappoint these people that I work with. Um, and they, I think they might still think I'm a little bit crazy at the law firm because <laughs> everyone was like, you're going to do what? Um, so I quit and did the New York City Teaching Fellows Program and then started working at Dewa Clinton. And, um, decided after a couple of years there that I needed to be outside of the school to really have the kind of impact that I wanted. Um, and, you know, I ended up getting to be a law professor and start the exact same clinic that I took that changed my life. That's amazing. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping to change other law students' lives and, you know, certainly hoping that my law students will have an impact in, in the schools that they work in, but it's not your traditional path. Um, and it's not your traditional clinic in a law school setting. Um, so sometimes I feel, um, like it's it's a little more difficult to for people to see the value in the in the work that I do. I, I can understand that. Um, so Deborah, we're going to pivot back to you. So I, 
I've known you for, <laughs> for years um, and years before you actually went into the diversity space. And you and I always had these conversations about what wasn't being said in some of these CLEs, which you, know, you encouraged me to, to get into the diversity space and start creating some of this programming for the New York State Bar Association and the Judicial Institute and all these other places where I talk. So what made you take the leap? Because, you know, like I said, I knew you when you were still practicing and then you went to the city bar and then now you're at Sidley. So what made you say yes to that opportunity and take the leap? Well, just like Amy, I'm working you know, 14 hour days in big law. I am like, and, and I went to a, you know, my prior firm was a, a place that you worked a lot. You know, you just worked a lot and I'm working long hours. I was just thinking when you asked the question, I remember the time I was sleeping under my desk with the pillow <laughs> Which, because we had a filing. I was like, OK, let me get this little airline pillow that I had. <laughs> and I just went to sleep and I, you know, didn't even think about it. I, I mean, you know, this is like, you know, 15 years ago. But my God. But anyway, um, so. I found myself very much involved in organizations, bar associations, just being involved in a lot of different things. And I was saying, you know, I like doing this more than I like doing this, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to kind of pivot. I mean, I struggled for a long time how to pivot because I think sometimes when people see you coming from big law, they think that's all you want to do as if you don't have other desires or interests. And it, it took a long time. And I will share with you that when you are doing great work and people are observing that, they want to help you. Mm -hmm. So I remembered, um, and this is a, a good friend of mine, um, Taya Grace and, and, and Joe Drayton had said, um, Joe's a partner at Cooley, it said, you know, there's this role at the city bar. Um, I'm, I'm on the board. I think you should apply. And I said, um, okay, I'll apply. I said, but I don't think I'm going to get it. They probably want someone with all this experience, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, Deborah, you have all this experience um, of, of what you're doing. And I'm just not sure why you think that doesn't translate. And I said, well, don't you think you should have the job before you have the job? And it goes back to making sure I ticked off the boxes. Mm -hmm. When it was like, my skills were transferable to this role. Right. I who doesn't know what it's I mean, I know what it's like to be in big law. Well, I probably should apply for this job because <laughs> you're working a lot. So I, I applied for the role. I went through interview process. And because of all of the support I received from both lawyers in the city bar, the New York State Bar, the Metropolitan Black Bar, all these organizations that I have been members and, and being engaged with for so long, reached out and said, this is the person you want to have. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, quite honestly, a dream, right? And so I continue to go back and say, everyone has to understand, you are your best calling card. You are your, so you need to have the work ethic and the demeanor that people would want to put their capital there for you. So just an FYI. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened for me. Okay. And I started at the city bar and, you know, it, the rest is history, but it just shows that sometimes as you're doing things for so long behind the scenes, you can be elevated uh, for a, a position like that. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Samira, you had a, a different sort of trajectory, right? So you started off at Big Law as well. And, and I don't know if, if the young ladies on the call are, are sort of seeing a pattern <laughs> where the, the people start off at the big law and then they, they do something else. But you started off in big law as well. Then you went to a high-end luxury fashion a retailer, moda operandi, and then now you're at WWE. So how do you get from big law to fashion to wrestling? <laughs> So, um, well, in short, by saying yes. <laughs> so I, um, over the years when I was a, a trial lawyer, I had gotten to know some of my clients really well, and they um, were relying on me as kind of a general advisor for um, things besides just um, uh, trial cases. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that role. So I started um, looking around for places where I could be a general counsel. And mainly the way I looked around was I talked to my friends who um, were in different industries and said, you know, I'd, I would love to do this. If, if you know of something, let me know. And so then one of those friends called me one day and said, 
hey, I'm working at this company. We're looking for a general counsel. You should apply. Uh, and so I did, and that's how I got the job at, at Moda Operandi, mm -hmm. uh, which was which was great. And it was it was really um, a different world for me because I hadn't come from fashion, mm -hmm. um, but um, I love fashion. Uh, so it was uh, it was it was an easy industry for me to try to learn more about because it seemed really interesting already. Um, and I got to uh, learn about kind of the inner workings of just running a, a business and what all of the kind of legal support is that you need to, to run a business. And that is stuff that I think applies to a number of different companies, not just ones in the, in the fashion space. And so then um, about you know, a little less than two years later, um, uh, the same friend who had been at, at Moda had gone to uh, WWE and mm -hmm. said, you know, we're looking for a general counsel here. <laughs> um, would you like to interview? And at the time I was thinking like, WWE, I, I haven't watched a wrestling match like for, I don't know, 40 years like, when I was a kid. Um, but then I started, uh, I started learning about WWE and I was like, oh, actually, this is really interesting. And so then when I, I came to, to interview at WWE, um, one of the things that um, uh, people said to me as I was, I was interviewing was that it was, it was kind of one thing for, for me to, uh, to come with, you know, having kind of a, a work history and an education history that I, that I did, but that wasn't really what got me the job. Mm -hmm. um, what got me the job was one, somebody was vouching for me mm -hmm. that I had worked with before. And two was that they saw that I was, I had been able to work in lots of different industries before and I could come to this. And then the, one of the actually bigger parts of it was kind of my, my background as an immigrant who has kind of had to make my way in this world mm -hmm. um, and a world that was kind of not something that I grew up knowing anything about, mm -hmm. um, but figured it out along the way. And that's the skill that everybody said, that's the valuable skill that will get you far here. Mm -hmm. And so it's sometimes those things that you, you don't even think about, right? You think about like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm very goal oriented, I have to get, I have to go to this school, I have to, you know, work at this job. But it's really those life skills that you learn even before that, mm -hmm. that I think really enable you to, to, to succeed and to kind of pivot when it turns out that you want to do something different than what you were doing before. Yeah, yeah. So that lived experience actually helped you um, learn and, and navigate. Yeah, exactly. So Amy, you've spoken a little bit about your, your trajectory as well. So, um, you know, I don't know if you want to, to just expand on it a little bit as to how, and, and I know you said that it was a real challenge for you, right? That people were kind of looking at you like you were crazy, but what made you actually decide, okay, this is the right move for me to go from, from you know, being a lawyer to teaching high school full-time and then to being a professor? Um, I, think, I think it sort of goes back to, what I was saying earlier about sort of giving myself permission to not be amazing at something on the first day. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you know what I mean? Not letting the fear of failure prevent me from even trying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from the time I took this clinical program in law school, you know, it really changed my life. And if you had asked me, you know, at the end of that year, you know, what would you like to do now? You know, I, I'd already accepted this job. I was, I knew I was going there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you said to me, what would you like to do now? I would, I would have said, I want to be a professor who, who teaches this clinic. Um, it, it really changed my life that much. Um, and, you know, I don't know that all the steps I was taking along the way, like, I don't know if I was consciously aware that I was sort of putting all the pieces together or the life skills, like Samira was saying, um, that, you know, that was where I was going to end up. Um, I was just sort of doing what, what I thought was next and was the next step for me, which was, um, and so I, I don't know if it was as premeditated um, <laughs> in that sense, but um, I was putting all these pieces together and getting all these different experiences from different jobs. Um, 
but it, it definitely is a hard thing to do to sort of walk away from the job that you think you're supposed to have. Um, and it was funny because I literally had forgotten about sleeping under my desk until Deborah said it. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, maybe that's why it was easy to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I 100% remember that. Um, but no, those are wonderful jobs. And there are, you know, it's a wonderful career for certain people. But, um, you know, for a lot of people, it is sort of the beginning um, onto other things. Um, yeah. and, so, and so it was for me. And um, I couldn't be happier. Great. Thank you. Okay. So we do try to teach our kids that not everything is going to be unicorns and rainbows, which you young <laughs> you ladies have already kind of alluded to with the sleeping under the desk and what have you. I don't think I ever slept under my desk, but I do remember I started off as a commercial litigator and we would have all these clothing and, and stuff, you know, to go over and, and look at all, take pick them apart um, if something went wrong. And I, I do remember leaving the office like at 1, 1.30 and knowing that I had to be back like at six o'clock in the morning and just like saying, what did I do? <laughs> like driving home, like, what did I do with my life? So, yeah. So, um, so because everything is not, all, you know, these, these unicorns and, and rainbows, what do you do when you've said yes, right? You thought this was going to be a great opportunity for you. You said yes, you showed up, you spoke up, you, you womaned up, you did all the work. And it turns out not to be a good experience. It, you know, it's just not what you expected it to be. And now you're looking at, you know, failure, um, eyeball to eyeball. So let's start with you, Amy, and go backwards. So, I mean, I think it is a really hard thing. Um, you know, I, it was one of the hardest things for me to realize that I didn't want to be a corporate lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a hard thing to do. Um, I think what I would try to do now is... You know, if I ended up in that circumstance again, would be really stop and think, you know, can I change what's happening here? Um, can I make this a place where I am loving the work? Is there something different? Or can I ask for different assignments? Can I, um, can I work on different projects, maybe with different people? Um, I would sort of try that first and then, you know, just really be honest with myself about, you know, is this where I'm supposed to be right now? Um, I've learned, you know, that half of figuring out what you want to do is figuring out what you don't want to do, right? And all of those things, you know, I try not to look back on the, the jobs that I've moved on from as, you know, a waste of time. I think about what were the skills I learned there? Mm -hmm. I learned this, that, or the next thing. And so I feel, I feel really happy about all of the experiences I've had. And I really do believe that they were the building blocks. Um, but I do think we need to be honest with ourselves about, you know, check in with ourselves and say to ourselves, am I happy? Um, you know, or is it time to move on? Um, and it, you know, it can be hard and very scary. Yeah, I, I can imagine. What about you, Samira? Same question. Yeah, I, I've i definitely had several times kind of in my career where I've been at a point where I haven't been kind of happy with what I'm doing. I need to make a change. Actually, the, the law firm where I spent um, about 18 years, I left that law firm and came back twice, um, and and part of um, part of what uh, part of what enabled me to come back each time was even when I left and I wasn't happy, I maintained the relationships that I had, um, and the made sure that when I when when I was leaving, right, it wasn't about a firm, right? It was about where I was in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, I did genuinely enjoy working with the people I was working with. And, you know, there were people that I, I, I stayed in touch with. And so as I stayed in touch with them, and then I didn't like what I was doing next, I said, well, come back. And so I, I did. And so one of the, I think the, the, the greatest kind of lessons that I've learned throughout um, kind of my career is that wherever you work, it's all about relationships, right? I mean, any company, any firm is just a group of people that you're working with, right? And that um, the, the skill that you really want to be able to, um, to, to gain some kind of mastery of throughout your life is learning how to, to, to work with people and to maintain relationships, even if you're not happy, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't have to say like, you, you don't have to put it on somebody else, like your own mm -hmm. happiness on somebody else, right? Yeah. And, and uh, if you can kind of learn that skill, then it keeps your options open because who knows what life brings, right? 
I never thought that I would go back to the same firm that I didn't like twice <laughs> and that I would then like it, right? But that's where I was. Yeah. And um, and so I, I, I think that you really want to, at least for, for me, what's worked is trying to maintain those relationships to maintain those um, option, that optionality. Thank you, Samira. Uh, Deborah? I was like, let me, how can I keep a straight face? It's very, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I love, I loved uh, the fact when Amy had said, you know, the skills I've learned for every place. I think that's really um, key. It's that don't look at places that don't work out for whatever reasons, could be culture, it could be, it's just not the right fit for you or life, whatever it is. Look at it as at, at a place and say, what did I learn? Who did I meet? And how can they take me to the next level? And, and not in a transactional way, but sort of like, like I mentioned earlier, there were people I've always volunteered and worked with that looked out, me, looked out for me for my first role. Mm -hmm. And so think of it like that, is that I'm learning these skills, I'm meeting people I like, and it may not serve me anymore, but at least I've taken away from, from that experience. And it's hard sometimes because, I mean, for, I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure most women feel like this and girls is that, you know, when you're ready to make the leap to move on, you feel bad about the people that are still there, especially if you have yeah. close relationships. <laughs> you're like, oh my God, if you're mentoring young women, if you're mentoring young men, you feel like, oh, I'm leaving. What is going to happen to them? Especially mm -hmm. if you're the person with the voice, right? Where you're sort of speaking up and saying, you know, why do we do this? Why do we do that? Who's going to be that voice? And I remember this role I had, I was very just sad that I was leaving and going on to a really exciting role, but sad that I was leaving people behind and wondering if they're going to be okay, you know, but, but I learned um, in that in order for me to grow in order actually off for them to grow too, right, to have them to use their own voice, I needed to move on. And I think that's something that it's hard. It's a very hard situation. But this is something that I, I have in my office and I've actually taken this same sign everywhere I go. It's, it's tattered, it's yellowed, but I love it. It's a, it's a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt and who I adore. And it says, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. And so I continue to say that to myself whenever I'm kind of like, if it's time to move on, she has been with me in every role. Um, just move on if it doesn't serve you anymore. And it's okay because you're not leaving people, right? You're just leaving that institution. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. All right, so we have a few minutes left. So I must get to my patented, <laughs> my famous question, which is a time machine question. And that is knowing everything you know about life and yourself and work today. If you could go back to the time that you were 13 and give yourself a piece of advice, what would that be? And then the second part of it, you know, after we get through the 13 year old piece of advice is, would it change at 18 or 25? And the reason I choose these ages is for me, they were big developmental earthquake ages, right? And I'll share another piece of, of information about myself. By the time we're done with these 13 lessons, everybody will know everything about me. Um, is that, but I grew up and my father was an alcoholic and not someone who like socially drank. I mean, he would start drinking on Friday night. Sometimes we wouldn't see him until he came back on Sunday. And when he came back on Sunday, we almost hoped that he was still drunk because if he wasn't, he would be guilty. He would feel guilty. And, and if he felt guilty, he would be angry. And he tried to kill us a couple of times. Um, he, like it was just, it was a really bad time. And I remember at 13 years old, hiding in the closet, right? Just going like this because he was screaming and, and carrying on and thinking, I'm not going to make it. I'm not gonna make it past 13. And of course, obviously I did, right? So, um, and then when I got to 18, it was something different because miraculously at 16, he stopped drinking. Um, you know, and it was the first time he got diagnosed with cancer, quit cold turkey. But then at 18, it was about how am I going to pay for college? Like, how you know, so you have different things going on at these different ages. So let's start with you, um, Deborah. 
at 13, what piece of advice would you give yourself? Um, it will not always be this way. You will um, thrive. You will um, buy all the books you want to buy. Um, and you will go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Which is interesting because I, I always share that I did not get on a plane until in my 20s because I just, you know, we didn't. And when I did finally get on a plane, I, you know, went to the proverbial islands or whatever. And then shortly when I became a lawyer, I was like, someone said, are you going to be going on your first international trip? Where are you going to go? And I was like, Egypt, of course. I've always <laughs> wanted to go to Egypt. And I traveled all over the world. And so... I would say for 13, it would it will not always be this way. Mm -hmm. um, and you will be able to travel the world and buy all the books you'd like to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Samira, 13. Well, um, picking up on uh, what, uh, what Deborah said, um, I, I would say that at 13, um, uh, that was, I think, a tough time in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it would be a similar message, which would, is that things will get better, um, and that uh, you just have to kind of keep doing what you love to do, um, and um, be close with the people who are kind of good to you, that you enjoy being with. You don't have to be friends with everybody, mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you can kind of stay true to yourself and find people that you like to be with and just stick to those people, life will get better. Amy. So I've been thinking about this a lot because mm -hmm. um, uh, my eldest um, child is a girl who's 12. So um, mm -hmm. I've been thinking about this a lot because I hear a common theme that 13 is, is it can be a difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, my advice would relate to compliments and criticism. Um, so when I was younger, if someone gave me a criticism, I would inflate it and I would make it global and so much bigger than it, it even was. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be perfect all the time, um, which is impossible. Mm -hmm. I've almost made peace with that. Um, and so my advice would be, you know, hear criticism, stop, look at it. Is there something constructive you can pull from it? Mm -hmm. And then just let it go because um, I really held on to it. Um, and then if someone says something nice, I always thought, oh, they had to say that, or mm -hmm. yeah, they were just being nice. Mm -hmm. um, so my advice to my 13 year old self would be believe them, <laughs> believe them um, and, and let, let all that praise be your cheering section. Okay, so what would change at 18 and 25? Is that for me? Yes, so we're, we're just gonna go the opposite way. We're now. gonna go the other way. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, if I'm being entirely honest, I think I would continue with the compliments and criticism advice because I still struggle with it today. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's you know something we're, gonna, we're all gonna work on or not all of us, but a lot of us are gonna work on for life. Um, but I think, you know, when I think about myself as 18 and, and 25, mm -hmm. I was really fixated on this one path. Like there was one way to get into law school and one way to be a successful lawyer. Um, and so if I were giving um, myself advice at those ages, I would say be open to new experiences because you never know there you're going to end up somewhere even better than you could have dreamed. Yeah, I love that. Um, Samira? So at 18, I would say my advice for myself would be slow down. Um, so I was very kind of goal oriented um, and I had this kind of, idea in my mind that I wanted to, you know, get to through college to get this degree, then get through graduate school to get that degree. And I, and I wanted to do it as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember one of my professors when I, I got into graduate school um, saying to me, like, why, why did you graduate college in three years when you, know, you could have stayed longer? And now you tell me you want to finish your you know, master's degree early, like I, I've gotten, I've been fortunate enough to get a scholarship. So it was paid for, like, so mm -hmm. why are you hurrying? <laughs> you know? But it wasn't, it wasn't about the, it wasn't about that. It was that mm -hmm. I had this preconceived notion in my mind that I needed to hurry through this to accomplish this goal so I could be onto the next goal, whatever that was, mm -hmm. instead of just kind of enjoying the journey mm -hmm. and just living the experience. That makes sense. Deborah, 
18. Oh, and- God, 18. <laughs> um, I think more of the same, but it, it will get better. Um, this won't always be. And I think at 25 is like, wow, you have really accomplished a lot more than most folks in the family. And there's more to come. And at 25, I would say to her, um, I'm extremely proud of you that you have kept going no matter what. And I think that's something as I think about it now, I'm like, wow, this is because I will be um, 50 this year. And as I think back, I'm like, I can't believe that you've accomplished all you have at this. And there's more to come. Mm-hmm. I want everybody to know this is not like the this is not the end for any of us here <laughs> on this video. We are always thinking about like, I think sometimes like when you're younger, it's like, I got this destination. And then when you get older, like, I'm not on a destination. It looks like I'm on a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think for me, it's like, wow, there's more to come. There's more to do. There's more to focus on and help and be engaged in and more to learn about myself for the next, you know, hopefully next 40 years. Yeah. But um, that's what I would say uh, to her at 25. I would say, you know, wow, look at look what you've been able to do. Mm-hmm. And at 18, um, it's, it's going to get better. Yeah. I, I've started telling my son who is 17, um, this piece of advice that I wish somebody would have told me. And so I'm going to uh, share it with you ladies and, and the ladies on the call. And that is that it's not about how you feel about somebody when it comes to relationships. It's how you feel about yourself when you're with that person. Right. Um, I, it just took me a really long time to realize that if you feel good about yourself when you're with that person, then that's a good person for you to be with. Um, But if you don't feel good about yourself when you're with that person, you feel bad, you feel demeaned or or not worthy, then no matter how passionate you are about that person or how good they look, that's probably not the right person. So I've just started telling my son that. And I think he's finally starting to understand it. Um, But I think it's it's very important. So I got a, a really great question from one of the attendees. And um uh, okay, there's, I got two good questions, but one of the, the first question that I'm going to um, read to you is, at what point does strength actually have no gender? Uh, is there a point in your career or your life that you stop thinking of yourself as a woman lawyer or a black lawyer or in, in just a person or a lawyer? So Deborah, let's start with you. No, I think being a woman is my superpower. And so I never want to be without like thinking that way. Actually, I lean into it pretty quick (laughs) and especially being a black woman. Oh, absolutely. I always want to be known. I know some people say I want to be known as a lawyer first and then as a black woman. Um, Actually, I want to be known as a black woman lawyer. (laughs) Okay. And I'm okay with that. (laughs) Samira, what about you? I would uh, would echo that um, because I mean, I've found that there are times in my in my life, especially when I was as a trial lawyer, people would kind of underestimate me because I was a woman or just not somebody they were used to seeing as a trial lawyer. And mm-hmm. that actually worked to my advantage quite a bit. Because um, mm-hmm. you know, when you're questioning somebody, if they're not kind of intimidated by you, they'll tell you a lot more. Right? Yeah, um, so I I agree. I think it's something that you kind of that's helped it's helped me to kind of lean into it as well mm-hmm. um so we we are getting a, a questions fast and furious here but you know we i do want to be mindful of your time um as well so i'm gonna go to uh the one question that popped up here uh, okay and, and we're getting a five minute warning is can you share a piece of advice on the value of mentoring um, so I guess I, I would modify that a little bit too. Did you have mentors who helped you get to where you are? So Samira, you're still on the screen. So, uh, we'll start with you. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, there, there are, um, I'd say that I, I don't know if I would be where I am now without mentors because, um, I have definitely had a lot of self doubt over the years and as one of my mentors would say, I'm my own worst enemy, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I've I've definitely benefited from that push from my mentors to say, yes, you can do it, go for it. 
mm -hmm. um, when I may not have done it myself. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Amy, I, I realized I didn't ask you the, uh, I didn't allow you to answer that last question about, you know, do you ever stop seeing yourself as a woman lawyer or, you know, a woman professor and, and just say, I'm a professor, I'm a lawyer, I'm, I'm whatever. Um, thank you. I actually literally had the exact same words in my head as Deborah said. I was like, I see being a woman lawyer as my superpower. That was the exact same words in my head. And I do think that um, being a woman lawyer is one of the reasons that I'm successful in what I do. Um, but I will say about mentors that um, they have been essential for me. Same as Samara said that, you know, as I talked about with compliments and criticism, I struggle with self-doubt and having, having a, an amazing group of people that you can just bounce ideas off of. And, you know, you have, you have to have the one person who's going to be as honest with you that you know, sometimes it's going to be painful, but mm -hmm. you have to get that person who's going to give you the absolute honest opinion and then have other people who are just going to boost you up. Um, Cause sometimes you need that too. Um, mm -hmm. So I think having mentors um, is critical for all of us and certainly has been for me. Yeah. And I think we discussed that. I think it was either uh, lesson three or four um, that you know, my mind is going, but uh, we talked about having a critic, right? That it's not just about having sponsors or uh, mentors that you also need to have those critics, people who are going to be honest with you and say, listen, you messed up or this was not right, right? So yeah, that I, I get that. I received that. Um, Veronica Martinez has says, I do not have a question in particular. However, I would like to commend you all for your amazing careers and everything shared is very inspirational. So thank you so much, Veronica. Um, and with that, with one minute to spare, um, I'm going to uh, go back to you ladies and just have you share if the ladies on the call can only take away one thing from this presentation the entire time that you've been here, um, what would it be? So Amy, uh, let's start with you and then go backwards and, and close it out with Deborah. So I would just say, you know, believe in yourself. You are capable of so much more than you might believe you are sometimes. Find this amazing community that will support you and be that, you know, supportive community for other people. Thank you. Samira? Stole my words. Uh, yes, definitely um, uh, believe in yourself. You, you're a lot more capable than you probably think you are. Deborah? I'm going to quote Eleanor Roosevelt again. <laughs> you must do the thing you think you cannot do. Mm -hmm. That is what you must do. You must do all the things that scare you, to stretch you. Even if you fall, you will get back up. I love it. So with that, um, everybody on the call, say yes, then show up, speak up, and woman up. <laughs> you have a good one. Bye, everybody. <laughs>